So, St. Simon, uh, have you thought it over? Yes, I have. And? There are a good many objections. Like what? Ran, you don't understand what's involved. Sure I do. It's what I do best. Business. Look, Robert, I know business is a dirty word over here, especially in your sort of family. You know nothing whatsoever about my family. Oh, now, that's where you're wrong, my friend. I like to keep my ear to the ground, keep track of whose fortunes are on the way up or down. Doran, you are no gentleman. <laughs> no, I don't have the pedigree, but I reckon I soon shall. What do you say? Here, health, wealth, and happiness. Health, wealth, and happiness. The Noble Bachelor by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatized for radio by Bert Cools. With Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr. John Watson. And featuring John Rye as St. Simon, Catherine Fershpan as Hattie, and David Healy as Doran. The Noble Bachelor. No, it's ridiculous. It's exactly what I've always wanted What you've for you. always wanted. When did you ever care about what I wanted? If we'd have done what you wanted, my girl, you'd be stuck away somewhere in a two-bit hovel without a cent to your name. That's the only thing you care about, isn't it? Well, I don't give a damn about money. Heidi. Oh, sorry. Not ladylike enough for you, am I? Oh, pa, this isn't working. None of it. I can't do it. Let's go home. You don't want to go home. I don't know what I want. I haven't had a moment to think since we got here. All I want is the best for you. You know that. Look, the past is gone. You can't bring it back. I know it. You got to think about the future. You're 24 years old. I know that too, damn it. Hattie. Sorry. This kind of chance, it's, it's not going to come your way again. Don't you, don't you like him at all? I like him well enough. Then promise me you'll think about it at least. That's all I'm asking. Just think about it. All right. I'll think about it. Good girl. That's all I wanted to hear. Lord Robert. If you brought me out here to talk, can we please get on with it? My feet ache and I want to sit down. Miss Doran, you are the most refreshing woman I know. <laughs> well, having seen some of the others, I can't say that comes as much of a surprise. <laughs> you see. Miss Doran. Yes, Lord Robert. I bear an ancient and honorable name. I know you do. One that I do not bestow lightly. Of course not. I'm sorry. <laughs> Aren't you supposed to go down on one knee? Oh, Mr. Rand, please. <laughs> I'm sorry, I really am. Please, go on, Lord Robert. I'm listening. Together, let no man put asunder. For as much as Robert de Vere Walsingham and Harriet Caroline hath consented together in holy wedlock and hath witnessed the same before God and this congregation, I pronounce that they be man and wife together. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, now, I, I know you have a set way to do these things over here, but I, but the way I, the way I see it, I, I'm the father of the bride, and if I want to toast the newlyweds, well, that's my privilege. <laughs> so, um, Duchess, lords, ladies, I give you 
the bride and groom. Get your bleeding hands off me! Keep your flaming voice down, they'll hear you inside. Don't you tell me what to do. My business is with Lord Robert, not the hard help. Just tell him Flora Miller's here. I'm telling you, his lordship left strict instructions he wasn't to be let in. He's got better things to do. Oh, yes, I bet he has, with his little American slut. When I get my hands on her, she'll wish she stayed at home. Right, that's it. Ah! Now, you listen to me. If you're not two streets away from this house in the next 30 seconds, I'll have you in the hands of the law faster than you can blink. Understand? Oh, you're breaking me arm. <sighs> All right, I'm going. But you can tell your precious Lord Robert and his new lady wife that they haven't heard the last of this. Not by a long chalk. The bride and groom. The, the bride, bride and groom. groom. <laughs> On behalf of Lady Robert and myself, ah. thank you. I still fail to understand, Mr. Duran, why this wedding was such a very small affair. Well, it wasn't my idea, Duchess. I wanted the whole works. Really, Mother, we've been over all this. We wanted a quiet, unobtrusive little ceremony. Unobtrusive? Intimate, if you prefer. That's what we both wanted. Isn't that so, my dear? Hattie? I'm... I'm sorry. Please excuse me. What extraordinary behaviour. Is the child unwell? Oh, she was fine this morning, happy as a sand boy. Uh, more champagne, Duchess? Hattie. Hattie, this is ridiculous. I know perfectly well that you can hear me. Open this door at once. This has gone on for quite long enough. You're being insufferably rude. Very well. I'm coming in. Now look here. I... What the devil? Oh, God. Oh, God. Excuse me, love. Are you all right? Yes. Yes. Good. Chin up, man. Keep smiling. Well, well. Look what the cat dragged in. Who are you? Or do I mean the Lord? What do you want? I want you, my lady. You and me are going somewhere quiet. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lord Robert, Mr. Duran. The whole staff's been out, but we can't find anybody who saw her ladyship after she left the house. How far did you check? Oh, three blocks in every direction. So, now half of London knows she's missing. Don't be ridiculous, St. Simon. We were discreet, my lord. All right, all right. Well, you got any other ideas? I say we should simply wait. Whatever ridiculous game this is, she'll tire of it before long. Game? We waited far too long as it is. Jenkins, I want you to go No! In. Doran, I'm telling you. That is not the best way. This is unbelievable. My daughter's missing and all you're concerned about is hushing the whole thing up. Well, you can forget it. I'm sending for the police. <sighs> this is ridiculous. Yes? Well? Inspector Giles Lestrade, my lord. About damn time. Show me in, Hardwick. My lord, this way, sir. Thank you. Lord Robert, I'm sorry what to have kept you waiting. What the devil do you mean by keeping me a prisoner in here, Lestrade? Yes, I'm sorry about that, sir. But it is the normal procedure. We have to see everyone separately. I'm sure you understand. I do not. I shall be speaking to your superiors. Uh, very good, sir. Now, if you wouldn't mind answering a few questions, Are I'd be most... Are you implying that I'm somehow involved in this ridiculous joke? Joke, my lord? Mr. Duran is extremely concerned about his Mr. daughter. Mr. Duran is... A... Yes, sir? Mr. Duran is an excitable individual with an overdeveloped imagination. Lady Robert is playing some sort of practical joke, nothing more. Fond of jokes, is she, sir? Look, Lestrade. All I require of you is that you organise a discreet search for my wife and bring her back here as quickly and as quietly as you can. Believe me, Lord Robert, that's exactly what I'd like to do. Then get on with it, man. And discreetly, do you hear? I don't want one word of this business in the newspapers. I understand your concern, my lord. <laughs> I doubt it. 
But unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to be able to hush things up for you. What? What the devil do you mean? In the light of what Mr. Duran has just told me. What are you blathering on about, ma'am? Well, sir, I was hoping that you would volunteer the information. But since you appear reluctant, I'm referring to the incident that occurred outside this house earlier today. That? Oh, that was nothing. Oh, I don't think so, sir. And with the greatest respect, I don't understand your attitude at all. I suggest you stop treating me like an enemy and help me do my job. Or do you want to see this turn into a murder inquiry? The curious marriage of Lord Robertson Simon, second son of the Duke of Balmoral, has long since ceased to be a subject of interest in those exalted circles in which the unfortunate bridegroom moves. Fresh scandals have eclipsed it, and their more piquant details have drawn the gossips away from this particular drama. As I have reason to believe, however, that the full details have never been revealed to the general public, and as my friend Mr Sherlock Holmes had a considerable share in clearing the matter up, I feel that no memoir of him would be complete without some little sketch of this remarkable episode. It happened shortly before my own marriage, during the days when I was still sharing rooms with Holmes in Baker Street. The weather had taken a turn to rain, with high autumnal winds, and the Giselle bullet wound, which I had brought back as a relic of my Afghan campaign, throbbed with dull persistency. Mm. No sign of letting up. No, sir. Did he say what time he expected to be back? Now, what do you think, Doctor? <laughs> he didn't even take an umbrella. Mrs. Hudson, he was disguised as a furniture remover. Oh, is that what it was? <laughs> well, furniture removers do not carry umbrellas. I wouldn't have let him near my furniture. Oh, I do hope it clears up for your wedding. Thank you. You shouldn't be on your feet, sir. Sit down and give your poor leg a bit of a rest. You know what the wet weather does to it. If it's like this next month, Holmes will be wheeling me up the aisle in a bath chair. <laughs> well, as long as you make it somehow. Mm, I shall miss you, Mrs Hudson. You've looked after me wonderfully well. Yes. Well, some people are easier to look after than others. <sighs> Mr. Holmes! Oh, Mrs. Hudson! <laughs> Couldn't you have left that filthy old coat downstairs, Mr. Holmes? Hmm? Look at the mess on my good carpet. Uh, it'll dry. Watson, I solved the case. Uh, the mystery of the Grosvenor Square furniture van? Uh, not one of your most evocative titles, my dear fellow. How about the adventure of the drowned detective? You won't let me have the details while they're still fresh in your mind. Doctor, you're supposed to be resting. Hmm. Mr. Holmes, please don't put that disgusting coat on the bed. Uh. Oh, really? I don't know why I bother. Ah, it was a simple little business. Well, it's obvious from the first. And it was the owner of the removal company. Yes, of course it was. Mind you, he was a clever rascal. How did you finally <sighs> trap him? Uh, he tried to enlist me into the gang. <laughs> Wanted me to steal Lady Holt's diamond tiara. Uh, what's this letter? Look, how much longer? Give her a chance. The curtain's only just come down. Mm. She should be out in a minute. She better be. Here, Flora, you got an admirer. Oh, yeah. Let's have a look. What you want? Flora Miller. Maybe. You've led me a pretty dance. Where have you been the last three days? Sick. Then why weren't you at home, hmm? Who wants to know? Lestrade, Scotland Yard. Come on. Mrs Hudson brought it up about an hour ago. Special messenger. Hmm? Impressive crest, isn't it? Uh, it looks like one of those unwelcome social summonses which call upon a man either to be bored or to lie. Social invitation? You? Hmm. I get them all the time from grateful clients and the mistaken belief that just because I've discovered who purloined their diamonds or murdered their second cousins, I'd like nothing better than to sit down to dinner with them and hear their life histories. 
Ah, but this may prove to be something of interest after all. Not social, then? Oh, no, distinctly professional. And from a noble client. Oh, one of the highest in England. Oh. Well, Lord Robert St. Simon, I congratulate you. On what? Oh, one of the highest in England. I assure you, Watson, without any affectation, that the status of a client is of much less moment to me than the interest of his case. Ah, oh, this business is hardly uninteresting. Indeed. Ah, the mystery of the English law, the American heiress, and the music hall dancer. Haven't you been reading the papers? Not for some days. Oh, well, this damn weather is about all I've been able to do. Do you want me to post you up? Uh, uh, I will call at four o'clock this afternoon, and should you have any other engagement at this time, I trust you will postpone it. Hmm. Obviously a man accustomed to being obeyed. Mm. Mm. Dated from Grosvenor Mansions, written with a quill pen of some quality, and the noble lord has had the misfortune to get a smear of ink upon the outer side of his right little finger. Mm. We have an hour. Give me the facts. Look, Copper, you're going to tell me what this is all about? Don't come the innocent with me, Miller. Do you deny that you issued threats against the person of Harriet St. Simon? So that's it. I've got a witness who saw her ladyship in Hyde Park on the day she disappeared. She was with another woman. Guess who fits the description. So? What of it? Lady Robert was in some distress. You struck her at least once... That's a lie! ...and forcibly led her away in the direction of the Serpentine. And now you're going to tell me exactly what happened next. This is a most painful matter to me, Mr Holmes. I've been cut to the quick... I understand, sir, that you have already managed several delicate cases of this sort. That is perfectly true. Though I presume they were hardly from the same class of society. No, I am descending. I beg your pardon? Uh, my last client of the sort was a king. Really? I had no idea. Which king? Scandinavia. What? Had he lost his wife? You can understand, I'm sure, that I extend to the affairs of my other clients the same secrecy which I promised to you in yours. Of course. Very right, very right. To particulars, then. I have learned all that is in the public prints, but nothing more. You'll be so kind as to fill in the details for me. <laughs> that is very little to add. Indeed. Well, we shall see. When did you first meet the lady? A year ago, while travelling in the United States. Mm, and did you become engaged while you were over there? No. But you were on a friendly footing. I was amused by her society, and she could see that I was amused. Hmm. When did the young lady come to London? Her father brought her over for this last season. And you renewed your acquaintance? Yes. I met her several times, became engaged to her, and have now married her. Her father is very rich? He is said to be the wealthiest man on the Pacific Slope. How did he make his money? In mining. Oh, he had nothing a few years ago. Then he struck gold, invested it and came up by leaps and bounds. So the young lady would have brought a considerable dowry? A fair dowry, no more than is usual in my family. And this, of course, remains to you, since the wedding is a fait accompli. I really have made no inquiries on the subject. Oh, very naturally not. Lord Robert, what is your impression as to the young lady's, uh, your, your wife's character? <laughs> you must understand, gentlemen, that my wife was nearly 20 before her father became a rich man. During that time, she ran free in a mining camp and wandered through woods and mountains. Her education has come from nature rather than from the schoolmaster. But would you describe her as impetuous? She is swift in making up her mind and fearless in carrying out her resolutions. Fascinating. On the other hand, I would not have given her the name which I had the honour to bear had I not thought her to be at bottom a noble woman, capable of heroic self-sacrifice. Of course not. Did you see Miss Duran on the day before the wedding? Yes. Was she in good spirits? Never better. She kept talking of what we should do in our future lives. And at the wedding itself? She was as bright as possible. At least... Yeah? Any detail may be of importance, however trivial it seems to you. Oh, but this was nothing. She dropped her bouquet as we went towards the vestry. A gentleman in the front pew handed it up to her again. The whole incident was over in a second, but... She was absurdly upset about the flowers. Did you ask her why? Yes, I did. And she answered me most abruptly. It was the first sign I've ever seen that her temper was just a little sharp. Had she damaged the bouquet in any way, perhaps spoiled the arrangement? That might well have upset her on the one day that she would have wished everything to be perfect. The damn thing looked perfect all right to me. Did Lady Roberts speak to anyone unknown to you between the end of the ceremony and her disappearance? No, not at all. Ah. 
The wedding breakfast was held at her father's house, I believe. What did uh, she do when you arrived there? I saw her in conversation with her maid, Alice. A confidential servant? A mm, little too much so. Still, of course, in America, they look upon these things in a different way. Did you overhear what they said? I believe Lady Roberts said something about jumping a claim. I have no idea what she meant. American slang is very expressive sometimes. And following this conversation... She walked into the breakfast room. On your arm? No, no. She was very independent in little matters like that. Ah, and then ten minutes or so after you'd sat down... She rose hurriedly, muttered some words of apology and left the room. Never to be seen again. Ah. It really is a pretty little problem. This is ridiculous! We're on the final suite, sir. We're not going to find anything. Hell! Pressure from the bigwig, sir. Sergeant, a woman is missing, possibly murdered. I don't give a tuppenny damn who her husband is. Sorry, sir. Inspector! Inspector! Can you come, sir? We found something. Watson, you're hmm? the expert on the press coverage of this case. Be so good as to unearth that report of the wedding, the one that mentions Lord Backwater. Which, which paper was it? The Telegraph? Uh, morning Post, I think. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yes, here we are. Mr. Holmes, what is this? Patience, my lord. Doctor, would you favour us with a reading? Certainly. Um, the wedding previously announced between Lord Roberts and Simon and the Californian heiress Miss Hattie Doran has now taken place. The honeymoon will be passed at Lord Backwater's country estate near Petersfield. Quite so, thank you. Well? Why was the wedding celebrated in such secrecy? Secrecy? There was no secrecy. What are you implying? Come now, my lord, this ceremony should have been the society event of the year, a glittering occasion, glitteringly described, instead of which, not three dozen words. Some of the other papers had even less. Why? I don't care for your tone, the sir. The whole affair was minuscule. There were but five guests, and your father, the Duke, was not one of their number. Why? Good day to you, sir. Sit down, Lord Robert. You dare And to tell be me, me about the scandal you so feared. <sighs> That's better. Now, what exactly is the nature of your relationship with Miss Flora Miller? It's nothing. Trifle. Oh, well, in that case, it should be quickly told. She's a dancer at the Allegro. We've been on a friendly footing for years. I may say, on a very friendly footing. Well, you know what women are, Mr. Holmes. Yes. Oh, she was a dear little thing, but extremely hot-headed and devotedly attached to me. And what was her reaction when she learned that you were to be married? Well, she wrote me some dreadful letters. And to tell you the truth, the reason why I arranged for the wedding to be so quiet was that I feared she might create some sort of scene in the church. Well, you can imagine the possibilities. Well, it's disastrous, no doubt, but in fact, nothing of the sort occurred. Not at the ceremony, no, though what did happen was quite bad enough. Ah, yes, and reported in the most excellent detail. Damn scandal sheets. When this lady tried to gain entry to the wedding breakfast, did your wife see her or hear her? No, thank goodness. But that fool Lestrade insists that Flora decoyed my wife out and laid some terrible trap for her. Well, it is a possible supposition. What, you think so too? I did not say a probable one. Flora wouldn't hurt a fly. Well, jealousy is a strange transformer of character. Pray, what is your own theory? Well, really, I came to seek a theory, not to propound one. But since you ask me, it has occurred to me that the excitement of this affair, the consciousness that she has made so immense a social stride, may have had the effect of causing some little nervous disturbance in my wife. You believe that she had become suddenly deranged? Well, I can hardly explain it in any other fashion. Well, it certainly is a conceivable hypothesis. Well, I don't think I need detain you any longer. I shall communicate with you. Should you be fortunate enough to solve this problem? I have solved it. What was that? I say that I've solved it. Then where is my wife? That is a detail which I shall speedily supply. If that is an attempt at humour, Mr. Holmes, I find it sadly misplaced. I'm afraid that it will take wiser heads than yours or mine to solve this mystery. Gentlemen. Lord Robert. <laughs> oh, it's very good of the noble Lord to honour my head by putting it on a level with his own. Have you really solved it? Yeah, before he ever came into the room. 
You don't forget that then, leave that. Sarge! You don't forget it. I've got a cab for the old man. For pity's sake, lad, he is, you call him that. You'll be on the beat for the rest of your natural. Oh, sorry, Sarge. What's the matter with him anyway? I thought he'd be pleased we found something. It wasn't exactly what he was expecting. Where's his cab then? Over there. Cabby wanted to know where he was going. Huh. Where do you think? Uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Much appreciated. Well, always a pleasure to see you, my dear Lestrade. Well, what's up? You look dissatisfied. And I feel dissatisfied. It's this infernal St. Simon marriage case. I can make neither head nor tail of the business. Really? You surprise me. Did he come to see you? You've only just missed him, Inspector. He told me he was thinking of it. Asked me if I had any objection. And did you? Of course not. I said it might be of some assistance. Oh, you're too generous. You're not having much luck with this case, then. Every clue seems to slip through my fingers. I've been working on it all day. And very wet, it seems to have made you. Yes, I've been dragging the serpentine. <laughs> In heaven's name, what for? For the body of Lady Robert St. Simon. <laughs> have you dragged the basin of the Trafalgar Square fountain? No, why? What do you mean? Well, because you've just as good a chance of finding this lady in the one as in the other. I suppose you know all about it, hmm? Well, my mind is made up. Oh, indeed. And you think that the serpentine plays no part in the matter? I hmm? think it very unlikely. Then perhaps you will kindly explain how it is that we found these in it. Lady Robert's wedding dress, Lady Robert's veil, Lady Robert's shoes. They've been in the water at least two days, as had this. Lady Robert's wedding ring. I appreciate your dilemma. All of the wrapping and none of the contents. Yes, we found nothing else, but it seemed to me that if the clothes were there, the corpse might not be far off. By the same brilliant reasoning, every man's body is to be found in the neighbourhood of his wardrobe. Are you hoping to prove that this is evidence against the Flora Miller woman? I'm afraid you'll find it very difficult. Oh, are you indeed? Well, I'm afraid that you've made two blunders in as many minutes. This dress quite definitely implicates Miss Flora Miller. How does it do that, Inspector? In the dress is a pocket. In the pocket was a card case. And in the card case was a note. This note. I'll tell you what it says, shall I? Meet me as soon as you can, Victoria Gate, Hyde Park. F.H.M. This is the very note that Flora Miller and her confederates, no doubt, used to lure Lady Robert within their reach. <laughs> very good, Inspector. Let me see it. Oh, yes. Ah, well, this is indeed important. I congratulate you, Lestrade. No, you're looking on the wrong side. No, no, on the contrary. You're mad. Look, here's the note over here. Over here is a fragment of an hotel bill which interests me deeply. Now, what's your opinion, Watson? Ca careful with that, if you please. It's vital evidence. Of course, Inspector. Uh, October the 4th, rooms eight shillings, breakfast two shillings and sixpence, cocktail one shilling, lunch two and six, class sherry eightpence. I see nothing in that. Very likely not. It is most important nonetheless, and so are the initials. So I congratulate you again. Now, if you'll both mm. excuse me, I think it's time for a little outdoor work. Uh, just one hint to you, Lestrade. Oh, yes? Yes, I will tell you the true solution of the matter. Lady Robert St. Simon is a myth. There is not, and there never has been, any such person. Good afternoon. The Langham Hotel, please, cabby. The Caledonian. The Grand. The Marlborough. The International. Connaught. The Fotherington. Argos. The Northumberland. Cool, Governor. You must be ready hard to please. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. 
Dr. Watson. Sir? Yes? What is it, Mrs. Hudson? I'm so sorry to wake you, Doctor, but there's a special delivery. A special delivery? What, for me? Well, no, sir, for Mr. Holmes. But I didn't want the men to come barging in on you just like that. The men? Just what are they delivering, for goodness sake? Excuse me. I thought I told you to wait downstairs. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, but we do have other calls to make. Now, where do you want all this food? How many times? I never set eyes on the damn thing before. Meet me as soon as you can. Victoria Gate, Hyde Park. F-H-M. Victoria Gate is precisely where you were seen, fighting with Lady Robert. It's not even my writing. Then one of your confederates wrote it for you. This is ridiculous. Oh, ridiculous, you call it? Well, I call it murder. And so will the judge and jury. Now, why don't you make things easy on yourself and tell me the truth? Holmes, I was beginning to think you'd disappeared too. Ah, they've laid the supper then. They've laid for five people. What's it all about? I don't mind telling you, Mrs. Hudson was more than a little put out. Huh? And what is wrong with the food I provide, I'd like to know. <laughs> well, I fancied that our company would appreciate something a little more epicurean. And yeah, they'll be arriving soon. Holmes, my dear fellow. I've been going over this business. Mm? With what result? Jumping a claim. Very good, Watson. I know it's significant, but I don't know why. Mm, is that so? Holmes, oh, don't be so infuriated. It's miners' parlance. Means taking possession of something to which another person has a prior claim. Mm, does it indeed? Mm. Ah, our first supper guest. <laughs> he should feel at home amongst these ancient and cobwebby bottles. Mm. Oh, 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 just listen to that. Oh, dear. Doesn't all go well. Mm. Mr. Holmes. Lord Robert, good evening. Good evening, my lord. Mr. Holmes, I am not accustomed to being summoned in this peremptory manner. If you have news of my wife, why did you not put it in your message? Because I feared you would not accept my invitation had I done so. So you do have news? Not concerning your wife. What nonsense uh, is Watson, this? Watson, be so good as to get Lord Robert a drink. His nerves seem to be somewhat on edge. Certainly. My lord? No, thank you. Ah, splendid. The remainder of our little party. Lord Robert, I am in possession of all the facts of your case. You know where my wife but is. But I do not believe that I am the best person to explain them to you. What? What do you mean? I have therefore invited two other people of my acquaintance to do so in my place. Pray excuse me. Lord Robert St. Simon, allow me to introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Francis Hay Moulton, the lady I think you have already met. Hello, Robert. Come in. Evening, sir. There's a note came for you. Here. Came? What time was this handed in? Uh, about two hours ago, sir. I've only just seen it. Everyone else assumed you'd gone home. Who delivered it? The lad on the front desk didn't know him, sir. Mm. But he uh, described him as a tall chap, sharp features, piercing eyes. What? Is everything all right, sir? Uh, no, Sergeant. It is not. Yeah, excuse me. Mm. Sergeant Sacker. Inspector. The woman in cell 15. Miller, yes, sir. Mm. Let her go. You're angry, Robert. Well, I guess you have every cause to be. Pray make no apology to me. Simply give me some sort of explanation. Well... Perhaps you would like my friend and me to leave the room. If I may give an opinion. Mr. Moulton, pray do so. I believe we have had just a little too much secrecy over this business already. Hattie? You're right. Well, gentlemen, Robert, Frank and I met in 81 in McGuire's mining camp in the Rockies. Pa and me were poor back then. Pretty soon we were engaged to each other. Then my father struck a rich pocket and made a pile. While my claim just petered out. Paul wouldn't hear of our engagement lasting any longer. He took me away to Frisco. Frank... Frank followed me in secret. He just wouldn't throw up his hand. It seemed to me, gentlemen, that love was love and money shouldn't come into the matter. Quite right, sir. But I'm afraid life is rarely as straightforward as that. Don't you agree, Lord Robert? Pray continue, Mrs. Moulton. 
We knew that Pa would never give his consent to us getting married. So we decided I had to make my fortune too. But before Frank left to go back to the mines, we got married in secret. Good God. Do you realize what you're saying? Yes, of course I do. It was just a clergyman and a few words, and then we split up straight away. But it was a holy pledge between us. Do you seriously mean to say, madam, that you knowingly allowed me to publicly humiliate myself and my family? Of course not, Robert. You may find it hard to believe, but I respected you and your family. I thought Frank was dead. I was working a miners' camp in New Mexico. We were attacked by the Apache Indians. It was a terrible massacre. Word went out that everyone had been killed, but that wasn't the truth. A few of us were taken prisoner. How long were you held captive? Four years, Mr. Holmes. And if you'll forgive me, gentlemen, I'd rather not say any more on the matter. Of course. After we had the news, I was ill for a long time, really ill. Then slowly I began to get better. And then Lord Robert came to Frisco, and we came to London, and a marriage was arranged, and Pa was very pleased. But I felt all the time that no man on this earth would ever take the place in my heart that had been given to my poor Frank. You escaped from your captivity, Mr. Moulton? I did, sir, and I traced my Hattie here to London. I stayed in various places. Your penultimate address being the Northumberland Hotel. <laughs> How did you know that? Anyway, this city's mighty big to track down one particular person. But I finally saw the announcement of the wedding in a paper. It didn't say where Hattie lived, but it did give the name of the church. Well, I had no choice but to turn up there and try to speak to her somehow. And I believe we know most of the rest. You can imagine what I felt when I turned around right after the ceremony and saw Frank looking out at me from the first pew. You deliberately dropped your bouquet to give you time to gather yourself. And I slipped a note into it. Meet me as soon as you can, Victoria Gate, Hyde Park, FHM. So that was the reason for all the fuss over the wretched flowers. Why did you say nothing to me of all this? In front of your mother and all those other lords and ladies? Robert, I was scared. Oh, I know I shouldn't have done what I did. And I've been so ashamed of it all. You went to Hyde Park directly you left the wedding breakfast? Yes. I was already upset by what I'd done. And some horrible woman grabbed me and said the nastiest things. Seems to me you had a secret or two of your own, Lord Robert. But I got away from her, met my Frank, and we drove away to the lodgings he'd taken. And that was my true wedding after all those years of waiting. I was all for telling our story and facing the consequences. But I persuaded him that we should just disappear. So I bundled up Hattie's wedding things and got rid of them so she couldn't be traced. And we were to go to Paris tomorrow. Were to, Mrs. Moulton? What made you change your minds? Why, this gentleman here, Mr. Holmes. He called on us this evening and showed me so clearly and kindly that I was wrong and Frank was right. I'll never know how you found us, sir. Now, Robert, you've heard it all. I went to the altar intending that I would be the best wife to you that ever I could be. We can't command our love, but we can command our actions. But now, well, my first duty has to be to Frank. I'm very sorry if I've given you pain, and I hope you don't think too meanly of me. Robert, please say something. It is not my custom to discuss my intimate personal affairs in this public manner. Then you won't forgive me? You won't shake hands before I go? Certainly, if it will give you any pleasure. Yeah. I had hoped, my lord, that you would join us in a friendly supper. I may be forced to acquiesce in these recent developments, Mr. Holmes, but I can hardly be expected to make merry over them. I think that with your permission, I will now wish you all a very good night. Mrs. Moulton. Gentlemen. Well, I trust that you at least will honour us with your company. Why, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I believe my wife and I will be delighted. Splendid. Allow me, Mrs. Moulton. Thank you, sir. It's always a joy to me to meet an American, Mr. Moulton. 
I am one of those who believe that the folly of a monarch and the blundering of a minister in far gone years will not prevent our children from being some day citizens of the same worldwide country under a flag which will be a quartering of the Union Jack with the stars and stripes. Uh, Watson, be so good as to pour the wine for the first course. Here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, you're very good health. <clears throat> and yours. Ah. Oh, it's been a, an interesting little case. Mm. It was, of course, blindingly obvious that the key to the whole thing was the wedding ceremony itself. Now, beforehand, the lady had been perfectly willing, but she repented of it almost immediately afterwards. But St. Simon himself said that when she made up her mind, she was absolutely unswerving. Mm, which meant that whatever happened must have been of tremendous importance. She spoke to no one, therefore she saw someone. She'd been in this country far too briefly to allow anyone here to develop such a, a profound influence over her, therefore the someone she saw was an American. Hmm? Well, it was no great feat to deduce either a lover or a husband. The overheard reference to claim jumping made everything clear. You have to admit, though, that... You never would have tracked them down without Lestrade's discovery of the hotel bill. Certainly I would. Simply have taken a little longer. But surely you didn't intend to check the registers of every hotel in London? Of course not. No, this is obviously one of the most select establishments. How did you deduce that? Well, by the select prices. Eight shillings for a bed and eight pence for a glass of sherry. There aren't many places that charge at that rate. Mm -hmm. Damn weather must be affecting my brain. Uh, well, you're the doctor. Uh, what was fortunate was that Milton had obligingly left a forwarding address. Uh, uh, one last thing for my notes. Mm, of course. All the way through, there's been something about this case that I haven't quite been able to put my finger on. You knew about it, and so did Lord Robert, and it was something that he didn't want discussed. Am I right? Mm -hmm, quite right. Congratulations on your perception. Mm. I commend to your notice a small piece in today's Times about the Duke of Balmoral. Mm. Since Simon's father? What about him? I hope he's a touch more gracious than his son. He's selling some paintings for the second time this year. Some of them have been in the family for generations. Oh, you surely can't mean that. This short of money. The whole family is close to penniless. Perhaps you wouldn't be very gracious either if you found yourself deprived in the same instant of both wife and fortune. <laughs> How is the excellent Miss Morstan, by the way? Mm, she's very well, thank you. Hmm. I'm greatly looking forward to our wedding. Ah, oh, make sure you keep an eye out for strange gentlemen sitting in front pews. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, now the case is cleared up and the client has departed, Hand me my violin, would you? And draw your chair up to the fire. For the only problem we have still to solve is how to while away these bleak autumnal evenings. In The Noble Bachelor, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Merrison and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams. St. Simon was played by John Rye Hattie by Catherine Fershpan, and Duran by David Healy. With Mary Allen as Mrs. Hudson, Donald G. as Lestrade, Tara Dominic as Flora, Ian Lindsay as the vicar, Elizabeth Kelly as the duchess, Andrew Wincott as the footman, Danny Schiller as the sergeant, and Stephen Garlick as Moulton. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Noble Bachelor was dramatised for radio by Bert Cools and directed by Enid Williams.